Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. This is part 4 of What If Naruto Was the Jinchuriki of the World Eater. If you guys enjoy this what if, and want to see part 5 of it, comment down below, and let me know. The like goal for this video is 200 likes. So like this video, to let me know that you're interested in this series, and you want the next part. And go ahead and check out other what ifs in the channel. Before we start please do support for more awesome content. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a like, and also share this video with your friends. So let's start this video. Tamari shuffled the sheaths off of her body and rolled over, facing the wall next to her bed. If there was one thing that was good about Garin being a Jinchuriki, not that she would admit it out loud or to anyone else, was that, since she never slept, she never needed pillows. Leaving another extra pillow for Tamari to use. Another she would never admit was that she liked soft things namely, pillows. Tamari. Who was trying to rouse her. Didn't they know that it was like, 4 o'clock in the morning. That was still pillow time. Tamari. Why wouldn't they shut the fuck up and let me sleep? Kami. She heard something shift over her head, but ignored it and tried to fall back asleep. That possibility was stolen from her when a load of heavy sand landed on her body. Gah. What the fuck? Tamari shot out of bed, ready to shout at the idiot who thought it would be funny to dump sand on her. And came face to face with her younger sister. Letting out an unidentifiable squeak of terror, the blonde Kanoichi practically teleported to the other side of the room with her blanket over her head. Garn. Did you need something? Garin watched in disinterest as her older sister tried to pull the tangled blanket off of herself, and brought up what she needed to talk about. Tamari you have had experience with males, correct? Tamari froze with her face half covered. Did she just call me slut? Ah uh, no, not really. Just a little bit. She didn't mention that it was because she had a sister that killed anyone that looked at her funny. She watched as her red-headed sister tapped her chin thoughtfully. Hmm, very well. Do you know why a man would stab a woman in the groin with a dagger that came from his groin, and both seemed to enjoy it? The blush streaked across Tamari's cheeks as the realization dawned. What? She squeaked in embarrassment. The Jinchuriki in front of her began to animate her sand into two figures, one with breasts and long hair, and the other with what looked like armor. And then she began to move them. Tamari stared with a gaping mouth and a furious blush on her face. Garin there is a lot we have to talk about. Naruto woke with a soft warm feminine body on top of his, holding onto him possessively and snuggling into his neck. Looking down at the head of raven hair on his chest, the mostly dragon suddenly recalled why he was lying in bed naked with Kurna Yuhi. After Tabella departed, he and the Jonin had gone at it for another three hours. She may have presented the image of a prim and proper lady, but Kurna had practically ridden him into the mattress last night. The only reason she hadn't woken anyone up with her cries was because she had her tongue in his mouth. Kurna shifted on top of him and pushed herself onto her knees, straddling his waist. She stretched her arms over her head and thrust her chest out, letting loose a loud yawn and several cracks from her spine, and sighing in satisfaction. She looked down at Naruto with sensual smirk on her red lips. That was a fun night we had, Naruto-kun. I'll remember it for a while. Kurunai laid herself over Naruto, pressing her body into his with their faces centimeters apart. At least, until the next time we do this. Naruto was taken aback by this, and it showed on his face. This isn't a one-off thing. The red-eyed Jonin pouted playfully. If I didn't know better, Naruto, I think you wanted it to be a one-night stand. I am not good enough for you. The blonde waved his hands nervously. No, no. That's not it. I... He scratched the back of his sheepishly. Well, I'm not exactly old. Kurunai looked down at him with a dry gaze. She bent down and kissed Naruto on the lips passionately, introducing her tongue into the fray, and drawing his own into her mouth. She pulled him up and slammed his back against the wall, wrapping her arms around his torso and meshing their bodies together. When Kurunai released Naruto, his eyes were wide. All right, I see your point. He muttered. The Jonin leaned forward until their foreheads were touching, giving him a coy smile. Let me make it simple for you, Naruto-kun. What mama wants, mama gets. Her smile gained a slightly fear ledge, and her eyes gained a pink tinge. And mama wants. Kurunai pushed herself off of the bed and grabbed her clothes. She gave him a smirk from over her shoulder. I'm going to bathe now, Naruto-kun. Why don't you join me? With her offer on the table, she waltzed to the bathroom, an extra sway to her hips that drew his attention to her ear. Naruto sat on the bed, stunned. He sat there for a few minutes until Kurunai's voice floated out of the bathroom, accompanied by the sound of running water. Oh, Naruto. He then swung off the edge of the bed and joined the Jonin in the bathroom. It was barely 5 o'clock in the morning. 30 minutes later. After getting clean, the two ninja had joined the rest downstairs for breakfast. Strangely, Tamari couldn't look at either Naruto or Kurunai without blushing heavily, and Garin was staring at the blonde with a searching expression in her eyes. It was sort of creepy. After breakfast was over the groups began to discuss the plans they had for the day. Well, we're going to try and follow up on a few more leads in town. Kurunai said while sipping her tea. Tamari nodded and drank down her milk. We'll do the same. Naruto checked the time and got up to leave. I've got to go. 
An old lady directed me out into the wastes, so I'll be there. I'll be back before nightfall. With their nods, he left the building and watched the rising sun as it peaked over the horizon. Directly in the middle of the yellow sun, a white light shined like a beacon. Naruto nodded to himself and wrapped hand cloth around his head to protect his face and eyes from the sand. Before he could leave, a rough hand clapped down on his shoulder and spun him around. Baron stared at him with an empty gaze. When you return, we will talk. She nodded resolutely. Talk about what? Naruto asked in confusion. The red-haired Jinchuriki looked at him like he was stupid. About what you did to the black-haired woman. Sex, I believe it is called. I would like ask questions about it. She said bluntly. Baron left Naruto standing there, speechless. These women will never leave me alone, will they? Passerby tried not to stare at the shinobi that was sitting with his knees up to his chest, shrunken in size, and drawing a small circle on the floor with his four talon, and muttering to himself. But I'm a good boy. Pulling himself together, Naruto stood and pulled his garments tighter around his body. Alright, let's do this Sudan. He said to himself, finishing in a shout. Worlds of air wrapped around his body, kicking up dust that soon fell to the ground, Naruto nowhere in sight. Ten minutes later. Something shot across the desert, leaving a trail of sand shooting into the air. Naruto had been running for about ten minutes now, and the white light was only growing brighter, the ring on his finger glowing in response. It was a good thing that his eyes had already changed. Like a camel, dragons had a hidden translucent vertical eyelid that closed in flight to protect the visual organs in their sockets. They were dead useful to keep sand out of his vision. He skidded to a stop in front of a statue, the air around him dispersing harmlessly. Wow. It was easily 30 feet tall, stark white marble shining in the sun. What looked like wings spread from her back, and her arms were raised to the sky. At this time in the day, it looked like she was holding the sun in her hands. Her face was stern, but gentle and caring at the same time. Two miniature statues rested near her feet. They faced each other, one hand connected, while the others tilted toward the ground, a stream of clear water flowing out and gathering in a small pool carved out of the marble. The ring on Naruto's finger pulsed brightly. The blonde pulled it off as it shifted back into the form he had originally found it in, and set it in between the two smaller statues. A beam of white light shot from the ground and into the beacon, lifting it into the air in front of the statue's chest, where it hovered, spinning in place. This also lit the water with a white glow. A soft breeze blew across his face, carrying with it a word. Drink recognizing the voice of Meridia, Naruto knelt at the pool and cupped his hand, scooping a handful of glowing liquid, and drinking it down. It was possibly the most refreshing thing he had ever drunk. White light filled his vision, and wind began to rush around his body, forcing him to close his eyes. When they opened, Naruto found himself floating high above the ground. The shrine looked like toy from his height. The air had a solid presence, but he still felt like he was floating. The ball of white light traced from the center of the sun and started circling Naruto rapidly, chime-like giggles echoing from it. Hi. The ball of light chirped, I'm Telly. Meridia's messenger. It's nice to meet you. The blonde tried to watch the ball of light, but stopped after the spinning made him dizzy. Uh, hi, Telly. Where's Meridia? The ball of light, Telly, stopped in front of his face. Mom told me to distract you for a minute while she slips into something more comfortable. Telly bobbed and hopped with every word, sometimes spinning rapidly in a small circle. I don't know what that means, but it sounds fun. Do you want to do fun things? Before Naruto could answer, a deeper, gentle female voice answered for him. Not right now, Telly. Maybe later. Please, go play in the gardens while I talk with Naruto. Telly shook with joy at the though of play. Okay, mama. By whiskers. The ball of light popped like a balloon filled with gold dust, leaving behind small particles that twinkled in the light. Meridia chuckled, and Naruto took the time to fully observe the deader clady of light. She had white skin, not pale, but actually white skin that resembled marble. Her eyes were golden yellow and matched the sun's color, and her hair resembled spun gold. She wore only what seemed like a loose dress. It is good to finally meet you in person, Naruto. She said with a small smile. I've watched you through my beacon for some time now. I'm glad you were able to return it. Naruto bowed and smiled back, before rapidly paling. Wait you've been watching me through the beacon. I never took it off. Meridia giggled behind her hand and drifted behind the mortified dragon, settling over his shoulder like a mantle. Oh yes, my dear, I saw everything including your chat with Tabella. She floated so she was only leaning on Naruto's shoulder and sighed. Her interference with your creation is somewhat unexpected, though I felt she would eventually do so. Meridia shook her head. In any case, this is not why I have called you here. She settled both hands on his shoulders, looking him dead in the eyes. My friend and guardian of my shrine has become corrupted. A malignant lick has latched onto her very being, taking over her mind and enslaving her power for his own uses. Naruto frowned. Enslaving a dead was chosen was a quick way to a long, torturous afterlife in oblivion. Who did this? And why? The dead shook her head. I cannot say his name the very words cause me pain, but I know what he is doing. He is attempting to use the power to raise an undead army. For what, I can only guess.
The blonde narrowed his eyes and growled lightly. An undead army would spell trouble for everyone, not just Kanoha. This mission just became far more important. Where is he? What do I need to do? Meridia smiled softly and stroked his cheek. Your dedication will serve you well in the future, my dear. Four miles to the east of the small town you approached from, hidden in the cliffs is an ancient crypt, built and forgotten long ago. You will find his servant, deep in the crypt. But be aware, he has also stolen my artifact, the Dawnbreaker, twisting its holy energies to strengthen himself. Naruto nodded resolutely. I'll do my best to bring it back. If you would set me down gently, I'll start. A fall from this height will put me out of action for a couple of days. The dead goddess pressed a soft kiss against his cheek and stroked his cheek. Good luck. One more thing, she raised her hands in front of her and weaved sunlight together to form a white circle with a small raised section. Take this flask and fill it from the sunwell. You will need it in the near future. With that final advice, light filled Naruto's vision, and he found himself back in front of the shrine. He knelt and quickly filled the flask, prayed for good fortune, and then took his leave, shrouding himself in wind and sprinting across the desert. Minutes later, he skidded to a stop as he spotted a thick column of smoke rising into the air. Oh shit, was his succinct thought. Speeding off again, he found what he expected. The town was ransacked, the buildings mostly collapsed and belching acrid smoke into the air. Teammate was treating the few villagers still there, and the Suna team was nowhere to be found. What happened? Were the first words out of Naruto's mouth. The entire team, even the normally unflappable Shino, was pale and shaking. Kurenai pulled herself together with ease from years of practice. We only came back a few minutes ago. We were following the lead nearby, but found nothing. When we returned, we found most of the town like this. And mummies. Dead mummies. They were dragging some of the villagers off. Kiba threw his hands in the air and pointed at Naruto accusingly. What the hell is with you, man? Your first mission, you kill an Iwa missing Nin, then you meet the new Mizukage, and now zombies what the fuck is going on? Naruto shook his head. Not right now. We have to track down those mummies. Meridia gave me a mission to stop the man making them, and I fear those villagers are not going to last long. Kurenai gave him a searching look, but acquiesced. Very well. But after this, you will explain everything, got it. He nodded and turned to Kiba. Can you track them? We need to be fast. The Inuzuka scoffed. Can I track them? Of course I can. I'm the best tracker he. Shino cut in with a monotone voice. They went east. I planted one of my females on one of them for this purpose. Follow me. Without any further words, she began to run, the rest following. As there and, Naruto noticed a slight shake to Shino's step and caught up to the Kanoichi. Shino-chan, is something wrong? The Ibirame glanced at him shortly, the fear in her brown eyes conveying her terror. I dislike Zami's I have nightmares. Naruto blanched. He could understand that. He feared many things as well. Don't worry, Shino-chan. I won't let them hurt you, okay? Her shoulders relaxed, if only slightly, and she nodded. There and, following the Shino's bug, and the trench left in the sand by dragged bodies. In the distance, a large funnel of sand formed in the distance and dispersed, before another formed and followed suit, dispersing in a cloud of sand. Get away. A familiar voice shouted as another funnel whirled across the desert floor. Teammate came upon the side of Tamari and Konkuro fending off four mummies, each wielding some form of blade, mostly katana, with decayed leather armor stuck to their dried skin. Konkuro was kneeling on the sand, his left hand clutching his side, blood streaming onto the sand, with the other hand controlling his multi-limbed puppet. Tamari was using her large fan, though neither of the siblings was being particularly effective. Tamari's wind jutsu only stumbled the undead, and Crow's small blades were ineffectual against the armor of the dead. Why won't you die? Tamari yelled, sending another jutsu at the encroaching mummies. The wind pushed the mummies onto their knees, but they rose again, relentless in their pursuit. Suddenly, an icicle, two feet long and trailing steam like a comet, punched through one of the mummies and lodged into another's head with a dry crack. A rain of kunai and shuriken peppered the other, sending it to the ground under the weight of the metal weapons. An arrow zipped past Tamari's head, ripped into the shoulder of the last mummy, followed by three more arrows that hit the other shoulder in both legs. The undead toppled over, still attempting to crawl to the ninja using only its shin. Hinata rushed over to Konkuro with her hands beginning to glow with green medical chakra, followed by Kurunai. Kiba stood back and avoided going near the dead altogether, while Tamari slumped over, leaning against her closed fan, panting from exertion. Shino had frozen at the sight of the mummies, her muscles locking in place, and leaving her a shivering mess. Naruto shook her shoulder in an attempt to wake her from her shock, but she only shivered. Shino. He said, come on. Snap out of it. But the Ibirame Kinoichi only stood, her eyes wide with terror and unseen behind her sunglasses. The blonde wrapped his arms around her shoulders and pulled her into a comforting hug. Shino's arms came up slightly and encircled his waist, but that only marginally reduced her fright. Sighing slightly, Naruto turned her face to his, lifting her sunglasses up onto her forehead and pushing down the high collar of her jacket, exposing her soft pink lips to the harsh sunlight. 
Naruto pushed forward and meshed their lips together, finally getting a reaction. Shino jerked against his lips, only now realizing that she was kissing her crush. Her hands came up to his head and entangled in his hair, pushing his lips harder against hers. They broke apart, the Kinoichi pulling her collar up in an attempt to hide the blush that colored her cheeks. Thank you. She mumbled quietly. Tamari sat in the sand next to her brother with an angry huff. Why didn't any of our attacks work? My Jusu would have shredded a ninja. That's just the problem, Naruto retorted as he approached the group of ninja. There, ninja. You are using attacks that would take down a human, against an inhuman target. He kicked the remaining mummy onto its back, and picked it up by the front of its armor, carrying it closer to the group. Everyone flinched when it hissed at them, jerkily attempting to move its limbs, jumping when he dropped it roughly to the ground, and pinned it with a scaled foot. Alright, quick lesson. He commented, pulling a scroll out of one of his many pockets. These are undead. A human corpse resurrected and animated by magic. They can only use skills they had previously known before dying. Their bodies contain the magic used to animate them, so severing the roots, which follow the veins, affects the same as cutting the arm off of a human. He explained, pointing out the arrows protruding from the mummy's shoulders. The only way to kill them is cause irreparable damage to the container, usually through the face or the chest. An example. Naruto unsealed an axe from his scroll and resealed the dagger inside of it. He bent down and pulled the mummy up, before swinging the axe down and into the mummy's skull, with a dry snap of ancient bone and metal. Notice the eyes. After the magic has left, the eyes stop glowing. This means they aren't being animated by magic anymore, and they can't be animated again. The others took that in as he yanked the arrows from the corpse and set them back in the quiver. Where's your third? Kuranai asked worriedly, noticing a distinct lack of red heads in the area. Tamari's face hardened, and she pushed herself back to her feet, using her fan as a support. Those things they did something to her she screamed and grabbed at her head, and her sand went wild, those mummies dragged her off with most of the townspeople. Kuranai sighed and rubbed her temples with her hands in frustration. We need to find where the mummies took the villagers, but we have no trail. How are we going to find them out here? She looked to one of her students with the question. Shino. The Kanoichi shook her head. The Kakechu I was following was on one of the bodies here. Naruto raised his right arm and opened his palm, letting an ethereal blue light coalesce in his palm. He squeezed it slightly, and a trail of incandescent blue energy appeared on the sand. I've got a trail. This only shows the way to go, so we'll have to search around the area it leads us to. Time was of the essence, so whatever questions they may have had were swallowed and stored for later. The Sabaku siblings and teammate followed Naruto as they ran across the desert. Suddenly, Naruto skidded to a stop, a frown of confusion marring his face. What's going on? Why did we stop? Tamari asked with frustration in her voice. The blonde shook his head. I don't know. The trail stops here, for no reason. He walked to the end of the trail and looked down at it, trying to discern why it had stopped. Then, Naruto noticed that the trail hadn't stopped at all it just went down. A small, sharp crack behind his back gave him only a second's warning. Ah, shit. The crack of rock breaking surprised the group of ninja, making them jump back in surprise. Naruto plummeted out of sight with a surprised yell, followed by the rest of the ninja racing to the edge of what they now knew to be the edge of a cliff with cries of concern. Naruto. Hinata screamed in anguish. They watched the form of Naruto rolling down the cliff face, bouncing off of the ledge before dropping straight to the ground, a cloud of dust puffing out around him. Tamari whipped her fan open and jumped onto it, balancing on the metal. We'll walk down, I'll check on the blonde, I'm faster. She descended in rapid spirals as the others fastened themselves to the walls with chakra, and began to make their way down. Naruto rolled over onto his face, a groan of pain escaping his lips. Ah oh, hey Aljun, you remember that time I complained about being armored? I do. Yeah, well, next time, remind me that I survived falling off a cliff because of it. Told you so. She did. The blonde pushed himself onto his knees and shot his left hand into the air, the ball of warm light in his hand pulsing rapidly as tendrils of light whirled around his body, making his form glow slightly. Naruto sighed in relief as the bruises faded under the healing spell. Tamari collapsed her fan and hit the ground softly, running up to the downed shinobi, and hauling him to his feet. Are you alright? She asked with concern. Naruto leaned on her shoulder, panting. I'll be fine, just let me get my wind back. The blonde Kanoichi wrapped an arm under his shoulders to take some more weight off of the shinobi, her hand unintentionally getting a good feel of the hard muscles decorating his torso. Wo Tamari thought to herself, his muscles are rock hard how hard does this guy train? Naruto poked her in the side, bringing her attention down to his amused eyes. I'm feeling better, Tamari-san. You can stop feeling my chest now. Or don't, I don't mind. Tamari jumped back in surprise, an embarrassed blush lighting her cheeks. Pervert. She shouted in reflex. The blonde raised an eyebrow in humor. So I'm the pervert because you were feeling me up. What does that make you? The blonde's blush now covered her entire face and neck. I meant you have a girlfriend. The Kanoichi with the heavy coat. Naruto scratched the back of his head, blushing as well. Well, kind of. 
I'm in a relationship with a couple of women no one seems to want to put a label on what we have. Tamari gaped at him in shock. Why? He shrugged uselessly. I don't know. I won't pretend I understand the mind of the fair sex. It's a dark scary place that will eat my soul, melt my brain, and convince me that wine is actually alcohol. Asuna Kanoichi gave him a dry look. You do know I'm a woman, right? Mischief glimmered in Naruto's eyes. He slowly and obviously dragged his eyes up and down to Mari's form, which was pressed into his side. Believe me, I definitely know. As he watched the blood rush to the Kanoichi's cheeks, Naruto heard a grumble in his head. And here he goes again. He can't help it, you know that. He's absolutely clueless when it comes to dealing with women. Doesn't mean I don't like it. What do you like? Blood, carnage, torture, lava, screams of terror. Never mind. I should have known better. Naruto was drawn away from his tenants by the scuffle, as the other ninja arrived and joined him and Tamari. Are you alright? Hinata asked in concern. The blonde stood on his feet, unassisted. I'm fine. A little banged up, but nothing bad. Where's the place we're supposed to go? Kiba griped, ready to get back to fighting. Shino pointed behind the Inizuka shinobi, where the mouth of a dark cave waited. Suddenly, Kiba wasn't all that eager. Remember what I told you, Naruto said. Kinjutsu won't work, neither will poisons or small wounds. Go for the big damage. Break them open if you have to. The group took a few more seconds to steal their nerves before they entered the cave, and entered a realm of the dead. What is this place? Kokoro murmured, his hands outstretched, chakra strings attached to his puppet. The walls were solidly packed sand, with a few torches here and there. They hadn't seen anybody or any bodies, but the creepy echoes and clicking unnerved them. The hall they were in opened up into a small room, where alcoves had been gouged out of the walls, allowing the bodies of dead, mummified men to rest, still clad in leather armor and their weapons. I don't like this place, Kiba muttered. It smells like dry dead flesh and blood. As if given a signal, the sounds of ancient bones cracking and dry sinew twisting filled the air. The mummies in the alcoves had begun to rise, groaning and rattling. Naruto dashed towards the nearest mummy, planting his axe into its skull with a loud crack and the death rattle of the body as the magic left. He ducked under a wild slash from another, and hacked the arms off and grasped the skull with his left hand, and crushed it into dust. The others had done well, despite their nerves on the situation. Tamari had kept her fan folded up, using it as a bludgeon to quite a good effect. The four bodies of newly dead mummies with crumpled heads, attested to that fact. Kiba, Kurenai and Shino had banded together, using kunai to keep the dead away. Kunkuro stood back and let his multi-limb puppy hack at the dead with bladed arms. A mass clicking and creaking sounded behind Naruto, as the others finished the last troll growth. He turned, only to find at least five more mummies charging into the room. Without thinking, Naruto pivoted, dropping his axe and thrusting both cupped hands out, white hot flames leaping from his palms and into the crowd of walking dead. To his surprise, the mummies lit up like a gas-soaked track. They quickly collapsed into a pile of burning bodies, only on fire for a few seconds before being consumed entirely, leaving melted metal behind to mark their passage back into death. Naruto looked at the Shen remains of the zombies with surprise. Maybe I overpowered the fire spell. He flicked a hand at a nearby corpse, throwing a small stream of sparks at it. It caught fire easily, turning into a raging inferno that consumed the body quickly. A wide grin stretched over Naruto's lips. Oh yes, I can work with this. He quickly brought his left hand up to his cheek, piercing the skin, and the rune inscribed invisibly there. He brought his hand up and let the blood drip onto his palm, where it caught fire and turned into an inferno in a bowl. Naruto pointed his hand at a nearby corner of the room, and squeezed the ball slightly. With a sound similar to a melting gong being struck, a fiery portal burst into existence, startling the others and making them jump in surprise. A figure emerged from the portal with a cry of joy and twirl of happiness. Yes. Ember cried out in joy as she danced around the room, leaving a trail of fire behind her. I'm outside. I get to burn stuff. Woohoo. She spotted Naruto, standing by the next hallway with an amused look on her face, and without warning, charged at the half-dragon with surprising speed. She slammed into him, taking both of them to ground in a cloud dust. Master. Ember squealed joyously, rubbing her fiery cheek against his. As the flame matronage clutched her master, the other ninja watched with shocked and amused looks. Tamari nudged Hinata's shoulder and asked, does shit like this happen often? The Hyuga heiress giggled into her hand at the side of Naruto, trying to escape the grip Ember had on him and replied, not really, only round Naruto. He's like a magnet for weird things like this. The creaking of Draugr alerted the group to another crowd of the dead coming for them. Ember looked up from her spot on top of Naruto with an irritated glare, even if she didn't have any visible eyes, on her face. Excuse you, I am cuddling. With an angry flick of a three-fingered hand, a wave of fire rolled over the mummies, incinerating the entire group, and leaving only the heavy smell of brimstone behind. Naruto pushed the Atronich off of him with a serious visage. Whoever is behind this knows we're here. We need to be fast if we're going to stop this. Everyone nodded, the humor in the air fading, as if it was never there. 
They prepared themselves for the next fight, and ran into the hallway. There were only a few Draugr there that were easily dispatched by the flurry of kunai from the ninja. As they ran past, Kokuro pulled the weapons out of the dead bodies, and distributed them back out, scooping up a rusted but still workable wakizashi as he did, taking control of his puppet with one hand. The side room filled with mummies was bypassed with Naruto almost casually blowing them into a corner with a sharp fuss. And were lighting the pile of corpses on fire as an afterthought. The tunnel filled with rubble blocked the path they were following, so they had to take a side tunnel and go around. As they ran down this tunnel, a scream drew them to a pair of large, ancient and heavy wooden doors. Everyone pushed against the doors, channeling chakra into their bodies to increase their strength, and the door didn't even budge, not even when they concentrated on the center. Naruto backed away from the door and waved the others away. Get out of the way. He shouted in warning. He crossed his arms over his face and chest protectively and jogged at the door. Halfway there, he shouted, Wold. With a thunderous crack, he disappeared in a burst of speed that would have the Yuan Dai Marikage blinking. With Naruto's weight and the momentum built up by jogging at the door, added onto that the speed that Whirlwind Sprint brought was basically shooting a cannonball into the old door. It was built to withstand much, but not that much. Naruto erupted through the door in a shower of lumber and splinters. Teammate and the Suna Ninja followed behind him. Taking in the scene at a glance, they saw several things. One was a pile of dead bodies, some more rotten than the others, and others much more fresh, including a few of the villagers from Sajin. Another was a group of live villagers, bound but not gagged, so their tormentors could hear their cries and begging. Another was Naruto, stuck in the far wall. Apparently, his momentum was too great for him to stop, so the wall stopped him instead. The last was a raised slab of stone, caked and blackened by dried blood. There were only a few drog around the room and they were dispatched fairly quickly. The last enemy was a living human, dressed in black robes and a cowl the exuded menace in fashion. He was dying, though. He had been in Naruto's path, and was subsequently hurled aside when unstoppable force met movable object. He had been impaled through the chest on a nearby torch bracket, with the metal prongs creating a cage around his heart. He was dying, slowly and painfully. Lying on the ground, dazed, confused and more than a little relieved, was Hana, the purveyor of the only hotel in Sajin. As the ninja started to free the prisoners, Kurenai approached the dying man and ripped the cowl away from his face. She gasped in shock and dropped the piece of cloth to the ground at his appearance. His eyes had lost all color, becoming a pale white that resembled the Byakugan. His skin had become gray and translucent, showing black veins that throbbed underneath. The man coughed blood and smiled a crazed, happy smile. Shikaku will live. He exclaimed with his last breath, closing his eyes the final time and dying a second later. Naruto managed to wrench his arms from the wall in which he'd been embedded, having heard everything the dying zealot had to say. That's not good. The crazed fanatic shouting something is never good. Tamari and Konkuro paled at name, drawing the attention of the Kanoha ninja. Do you know something? Kurunai asked seriously. The two Suna ninja glanced at each other, and held a silent conversation with just their eyes and small facial twitches. It ended with Tamari glaring at her brother steadily as he shook his head in a panicked fashion, before he sighed and gave her a look, that said you do it. The blonde Kanoichi turned to them and rubbed her temples. Garin is the Jinchuriki of the Chibi no Tanuki, Shikaku. Having the one tail sealed inside of her pinpoint control of any sand, but the seal was poorly made and lets Shikaku torment her from her own mind. It also takes over when she sleeps, so she is a forced insomniac. She likes to sit on top of buildings to watch the moon at night. Naruto had his fists clenched in anger at the thought of someone like him being tortured by something she never asked for. And then the last part of Tamari's explanation hit. Thankfully, the majority of his blush was covered the clan markings on his cheeks. Kurenai had no defense, however. They shot each other an embarrassed look, the same though running through their heads. She probably saw us having sex. Tamari noticed the eye contact and filed it away for later. I think someone would have fixed the seal earlier, but no Aninsuna has the sealing skill to do so, so Shikaku runs free in my sister's head. She said with sadness. Naruto felt a spike of curiosity from the Kyubi within his mind. Strange. She commented. What's strange? He asked. Shikaku is a dude's name last I checked, all of the Biju are female. And the Ichibi was never called anything other than her name. Which is. He probed gently. Kyubi scoffed in his head. As if I would tell you. There aren't many things I hold sacred. Eljun's muttering of no, really. Went ignored. But one of those is my sister's names. Those are earned. And before you ask, you have yet to prove yourself to me, despite whatever my father says. Naruto narrowed his eyes in thought, but was drawn away by Kurenai speaking. Someone will have to watch over the villagers while we go further. Will anyone volunteer? She asked. Without any hesitation, Konkuro raised his hand. I'll do it. When Tamari gave him an accusing glare, he explained. Look, I'm not the most physical of shinobi, and it's only going to worse from here. I wouldn't be of much help anyways, I use poisons too much without anything else, really. He held up a finger in declaration. Which, if we survive this, I am going to fix. 
He jacked a thumb at the multi-limbed puppet standing inert next to him. Plus, with Karasu here, it's like a two for one. So that's a bonus. Kurenai tapped her chin in thought, glancing at Kiba with thoughtful eyes. He noticed the look. Oh, fuck no. I am not staying here watching some old people. Do you know any non-clan related techniques, Kiba? His sensei asked. Anything beyond Inuzuka techniques? Yeah. He stated, I know the Bunshin, Kawarimi and the Henge. I had to know to pass the exam. Shino stepped forward with a harsh tone. We are wasting time. Kiba, you use Akamari to pass the Bunshin test. You take 3.17 seconds to form the hand seals for Kawarimi, and another 1.2 seconds to actually use the technique. Henge is useless here, they're all magically animated corpses. All of your clan techniques area close to mid-range combat, but would be helpful if our enemies didn't use swords. You would be best suited to staying behind to protect the elderly and the civilians. Now stop arguing, we need to move. The others stared at the Ibirame Kinoichi with shock. Most hadn't heard her speak that much over the years they've known her, especially with the tone. But but. Kiba protested weakly. Shino reached into her thigh pouch and pulled out a roll of explosive notes. She then rolled them up into a cylinder and bopped Kiba on the nose. Stay. She tucked her hands into her pockets, and walked out of the room. Still shocked, the others not staying behind followed her. Naruto suddenly drawn out of his shock by realization asked, Has anyone seen Ember? Shino pointed ahead of them at the trail of blackened sand that went down the hole. They could faintly hear shouts and laughter. Fire. Ha 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 ha. Burn, mummy man, burn. They ran after her, only seeing scattered embers and ash decorating the holes. When they finally caught up, they found her unleashing a torrent of flames on a group of helpless Draugr while laughing manically. When Ember finally stopped, she drooped, the flames that crackled around her body turning red. She spun around and latched onto Naruto with a desperate voice. Master. My flames are dimming. You must stop them. Slightly worried, Naruto asked, how can I do that? Ember responded by stroking his cheek with her hand, her flames turning pink. You must kiss me, M-A-S-T-E-R. Your mouth is white hot metal, Ember. Naruto pointed out dryly. The flame at Janich pouted. You can take it. Without saying a word, Naruto wreathed his hand in fire and grabbed Ember's arm. As he thought, she glowed and her flames brightened. Ignoring her sat all. They moved on. Oddly enough, they didn't come across any more mummies. They did find some old books that were sealed into a scroll Tamari carried on her for a later investigation. The door they found was a large stone behemoth that could fit eight men shoulder to shoulder. Ahead of that door was a team of Draugr under the command of another zealot, this one a woman. They were clearing away rubble from the main hallway. The group exchanged looks and nodded. Naruto made a motion for Ember to stay back before pulling another axe out of his scroll, as the Kanoichi grabbed Kunai. Kurenai snuck up behind the zealot as the others prepared to throw. Quietly, she reached up, wrapping a hand around the zealot's mouth and an arm around her throat, as the others let fly with weapons. Two axes and four kunai found their marks in the back of the mummy's heads, and they fell with only the dry cracking of skulls and metal to mark their passing. Kurenai tied the zealot to a nearby wooden support with ninja wire, and ripped a cowl from her head. The zealot did not look any better than the other, with lank brown hair, pale eyes and black veins crawling underneath her skin. What is your purpose here? The sensei demanded, her kunai at the woman's throat. The zealot laughed crazily, showing yellow teeth. You can't stop my lord. Shukaku will live. My life for my lord. Her eyes rolled up into her head, and she started to shake violently. Red light began to stream from her body, flowing away from her and through the door. Recognizing a health-draining spell, Naruto dashed forward and swung his axe forward into the zealot's bared neck. With a meaty chop, the woman's head rolled off of her shoulders and onto the ground, her body going slack. The Kanoichi had jumped back at the first glow. Glowing, in the ninja world, meant bad things. Usually, it meant a fire jutsu or an explosive tag. They were relieved that nothing had exploded. I have a bad feeling about whatever is behind this door, Tamari commented, looking at the behemoth in their way. She walked up to it and pushed gently, trying to gauge how heavy the door was. To her surprise, both doors swung open smoothly and quietly, very contradictory for an ancient stone door. Tamari paled, as did the others who joined her a second later. Oh shit. Standing in rows upon rows, shoulder to shoulder and still as the grave were hundreds of mummies. But, unlike the ones they'd seen before, these wore armor that bore more than a passing resemblance to samurai armor, freshly polished with a katana and wakasashi pair on their belts. Very slowly, the group of ninja and one Atronich backed away from the door, and once out of view of the undead army, they dashed over to a wall. Hinata had her jujutsu activated, examining the room and the bodies within. None of mummies in there are being animated. It's just a large amount of bodies standing in one spot. Kurenai though for a second, brightening when she had an idea. We all know the walk-walking exercise, right? She asked, looking at Tamari for confirmation. When she nodded, the sensei continued. We can well walk over the army by sticking to the roof. Hinata, I want you to keep your Byakugan on the entire time, alright? We'll have to be quick. Getting their agreements, the jonin led them just past the doors and to the wall. 
Naruto dismissed Ember back to her place within his mind, ignoring her whines of protest. Kurenai crawled up the wall, using both her hands and her feet for safety, with Tamari, Hinata, Shino and Naruto following. The veins around Hinata's eyes were bulging, indicative of her usage of the Byakugan. They took it slowly, but it was starting to wear on the ones with lesser chakra pools. Sweat began to drip down Hinata's face, and she started panting. Seeing her distress, Naruto grabbed the Kanoichi and pulled her onto his chest, so he had his hands free, and she could recuperate, if only a little. He shifted her onto his back as they landed on the other side of the cavern, and handed out a few vials full of green liquid. Drink these, it'll boost your chakra. The girls threw the drinks back without question, blinking in surprise when they felt their reserves were filled. After taking up arms again, they moved through the doorway and up a steep incline. They came to a fork, the smaller one leading left and the larger leading right. I think the living quarters for whoever's in charge, is down the left, and the other path leads to something else. Naruto commented. We might find something useful on the living quarters, so let's go that way first. The group made their way down the left hand hall, on alert for anything suspicious. Finding only a wooden door that was unlocked, they relaxed slightly and entered. There was a bed, a desk overflowing with ancient scrolls and tomes, and then something that made Naruto gasp in shock. It was a pillar of stone, carved with sigils and archaic runes, topped with a round slab of stone with more runes and pictures, the most outstanding ones being a hand that seemed to be on fire, a strange runic character that looked kind of like a gate, and a bird with its wings spread. They stood out the most, because they were glowing a light blue. Naruto's eyes looked like they were about to pop out of his skull. Holy shit. He muttered quietly. He has an enchanter's table. An enchanter's table. Now, the blonde was legitimately freaking right the fuck out with excitement. By Akatosh. I thought these didn't exist anymore. He ran over to it and examined every angle of the table. This is in perfect working order. I've got to take this. He pulled a ceiling scroll from within one of the pockets on his vest, and sealed the table away with a puff of smoke. Alright, nerd moment over, let's take a look at this desk. Naruto walked over to the desk and started flipping through books, joined a second later by the others. They scanned over everything there, finding scrolls on ancient Suna history, which Tamari took to bring back to Sunagakure. Shino had found a leather-bound book that she was reading intently. Naruto shifted a scroll out of the way and found a purple book with the rune of alteration on the front. Flicking it open, he found the title and quickly scolded his reaction to boredom. Shino called the others over to her to look at the journal, and he took the chance to disintegrate the book on how to raise zombies with a quick application of lightning. Look at this, Shino murmured, holding the book wide. They read through it quickly. It was about a man named Takeshi, an anthropologist from the court of the Wind Daimyo. It detailed his discovery of the catacombs and his excitement over the history of his people, his discovery of a strange statue made out of black rock that spoke to him and told him about a man named Shukaku, an immortal who had gained power by latching his soul onto a biju and subjugating it to his will. It then began to devolve into increasingly insane ramblings, followed by the line, My life for Shukaku. My life for my lord. That repeated several times before the journal ended abruptly. The group traded worried looks with one another. So, we have a maniac with an army of Samis, who's serving a mad priest who's controlling the Ichibi, who took my sister, so they could rip the power out of her body and take over the world. Tamari sighed and rubbed her temples in distress. Great. She felt the hands of Kurenai, Hinata, Shino and Naruto, as they tried to give her some measure of comfort. Tamari shook it off and stood, taking a deep fortifying breath. Alright, no use sitting around feeling bad for my sister, let's go get her back. Grabbing the journals and scrolls as evidence, they left the room and strode down the other fork, preparing to face the insane Takeshi. They came to a large stone door that had a wooden bar keeping shut and locked. Forgoing any sort of stealth, Naruto drew his right foot back and kicked the center of the door in the bar. The door was ripped off of its hinges as the bar splintered, and suddenly, the wish they hadn't taken the other path first. Garin's screams of agony echoed through the large room from the back. She lay on her back, tied down to an altar by her hands, and feet across a large room, the floor made of sand and covered in hundreds, if not thousands of bones. Standing up Garin was a man, with long, greasy locks of hair and a scraggly beard. His eyes were sickly yellow, and his skin was a pale grey with black veins that throbbed under his skin. He stood above her, holding a black book in one hand and a small black statue in the other. Dark malicious energy streamed from Garin's stomach and into the statue, as she screamed in pain. Garin. Tamari shouted, drawing her fan and sprinting across the field of sand and bones. Get away from her. A sharp gust of wind flew from her iron fan at Takeshi, but impacted a couple of feet away from him on a shimmering shield of magic. The mad anthropologist looked at them with crazed eyes. Defilers. Debasers and defilers. My lord will take your souls. Black energy raced across the ground, gathering bones and fitting them together into whole fleshless skeletons that grabbed other bones for weapons. Tamari growled and swung her fan around her body. Get out of my way. Kamatachi no Jutsu. 
She released the whirlwind that scattered the skeletons easily, picking up many bones and throwing them across the room. My master is risen. Takeshi screamed in triumph as he hefted the statue over his head. Before they could stop him, he slammed it onto Garin's chest. The metal melted across her chest and formed over it into a small piece of armor that had two glowing yellow eyes and a crooked mouth filled with broken teeth. I am alive and powerful once more. Shikaku crowed gleefully. He pulled Garin's body up like a puppet, her head dangling listlessly with her eyes rolled up into her head. I sense fresh souls, powerful souls. I will devour them. He leapt from the altar to the middle of the room, as his malicious power began to permeate the entire room. The sand and bones began to swirl about his form, as pure power threw the other ninja to every corner of the room. They could only watch in shock as the sand condensed around Garin's form, helpless to stop it. The sand formed the top half of a body sticking out of the ground, the bones ground to dust, and applied about the body like armor. Four arms stuck out from its shoulders, topped by claws. The head was made up of a multitude of skulls that formed into a bone-white sick grin. Come to me. I hunger for your souls. In the large room that held the villagers from Sajin, the ground trembled ominously, dust falling from the rafters. Konkuro and Kiba, playing with his puppet and his puppy respectively, looked up at the roof in trepidation. They looked at each other, and then the villagers. I think we should get the fuck out of here. Kiba said bluntly. Agreed. Konkuro said quickly. After gathering the villagers, they booked it out of the catacombs as fast as they could go. Shikaku raised two of his arms in front of his face, catching the Kaden technique from Kuranai, and allowing it to glass those limbs. With a roar, the sand monster shattered his limbs with his other arms, allowing them to shatter on the ground, before they were ground into sand and reattached. Shino and Hinata could not do much, but dodged the arms of Shikaku that attacked them. Their sensei found that none of her genjutsu worked, Shikaku not having any eyes or other human parts for her techniques to work. She was reduced to using her ninjutsu, of which she knew very little, compared to others. She was a jonin for a reason, but this was beyond her abilities. She had teamed up with her students, raining kunai and shuriken down on Shukaku, and doing nothing to damage him. Tamari unleashed jutsu after jutsu, trying to peel away at the sand covering her sister, but the arms struck out at her, forcing her to dodge or redirect her techniques to save her life. Naruto ran forward, sliding underneath a swing and jumping onto the limb as it came back. He climbed towards the head, wary of the other arms, using his axes as handholds. Jumping the last distance, he swung himself around Shukaku's neck, digging his talon feet into the sandy back. He hacked away at the head, leaning back as it tried to rip him from his perch. The San Naruto had been standing on but, throwing him into the air, where one of the arms caught him. Little fly, fly away. Shukaku taunted, pulling his arm back to hurl Naruto in a wall. The blonde half-dragon acted quick, summoning a fireball to his hand, and launching it into the sand monster's laughing face. Shukaku roared in pain and flung Naruto away, clutching at his face. Naruto landed next to Tamari roughly, rolling and hopping to his feet. Together. They yelled at the same time, having the same idea. Tamari pulled her fan back, and then whipped it forward. Takamitachi no jutsu. Naruto summoned up his power from within his throat, breathing deeply and then exhaling as he shouted, Yo. The torrent of flame that leapt from his mouth mixed with the tornado of wind blades Tamari had summoned, empowering both. The wall of flame burned towards Shikaku's form. In an act of desperation, the monster ripped open its his chest, and showed the tortured form of Garin inside, ready to be consumed by the conflagration. Shit. Naruto yelled in alarm. He leapt forward, and opened his mouth, shouting once more. Dull do. The wall of flame stopped, and reversed course, flying back towards Tamari and Naruto. A funnel of energy erupted from Naruto's mouth and caught the fire, sucking it into his mouth and lungs. It finally dissipated, leaving Naruto coughing ash. Fools. Shukaku boomed, your emotions will be the end of you. He lashed out, striking Tamari and throwing her across the room and into Shino. He then whipped another arm around and hit Naruto full force, hurling him into a pillar on the other side of the room. Naruto hit the pillar hard. He could feel his ribs shatter and rip out of his back, making him cry out in pain. He hit the ground and lay there, his vision covered by black spots. His vision flickered in and out, until something white and round rolled into his eyesight and then fell to the ground. Absently grabbing it, Naruto examined the small flask he had been given by Meridia. Suddenly, his thoughts were pulled back to that morning. Take this flask and fill it from the sunwell. You will need it in the near future. His eyes widened in realization as Aljun cast a heavy healing spell from within his body. Come on kid. We can only do so much. Finish it. I will not have my mate dying on me, not to fucking Shukaku of all people. Get your ass up. Naruto's ribs popped back into place, but he ignored the pain and dashed across the room to the girls. I know how to end this. Hit the shoulders with explosive tags. Without waiting for their consent, he ran forward, right in front of Shikaku. You have come to die, mortal. Good, I don't want to waste any more time with you insects. Four kunai, explosive tags wrapped around the handles, struck his shoulders and detonated, the explosions tearing his sandy limbs off and sending them to the floor. 
Naruto drew back and pulled on as much power as he could, concentrating on his throat. He leaned forward, opening his mouth roaring. Fusro. A wave of pure force, three times as large and powerful as any others before it, erupted from Naruto's mouth, tearing across the distance and smashing into the Shukaku's face, obliterating it into a trillion particles of sand, leaving a jagged hole in the neck and bending his body back. Naruto leapt forward, digging his talons in, and pushing himself up Shukaku's body to his shoulders, where his head was already starting to regrow. With the flask in hand, Naruto jumped onto Shukaku's shoulders, planted his feet on either side of the neck, and hurled the flask down into the hole. Down, straight to where Garn resided. No. White light exploded from within the body, scattering the sand into the air, as well as throwing Naruto across the room, where it landed on the stone altar. The girls were thrown back by the force, shielding their face from the light and sand. They looked up and saw Garn. The black breastplate that had covered her chest lightened to appear white as a tendril of black energy leapt from it and into Takeshi. Her eyes glowed white as the sand she had been surrounded by lost color, and became pure white. Takeshi leapt from his spot and raced towards the altar fearfully. A whip of white sand lashed around his ankle and pulled him to the ground. Looking back, he saw Garin with a fierce scowl on her normally placid face. Shukaku. You do not get to run. Not after what you've done. His dark power lashed out against her sand, battling fiercely for his freedom as Shukaku overrode Takeshi's mind. No. I will not be destroyed by you. Naruto watched in awe as the two forces battle, before his mind was visited by a soft, airy presence. My champion. You must hurry. My sword, Dawnbreaker, is just above you. It is the only thing that can finally destroy Shikaku forever. Looking up, he spotted the golden, scaled hilt of the Dawnbreaker, sticking from a pillar of black stone where it was buried. Naruto pushed himself up and raced towards the stairs leading to the pillar, something Shikaku noticed. No. He threw a bolt of malicious black energy that was intercepted by a bowl white sand, dispersing both. You will pay for all those centuries of torture. The chibi within Garin cried angrily, focusing her sand into a lance that she hurled at the body of Takeshi, which smashed against his shield of black energy. Holy fire erupted from the Dawnbreaker, engulfing Naruto within its flames. It tore at his face, stripped the flesh from his cheeks and stabbed at his eyes, but he still persevered through it. I will not be ended like this. Shikaku screamed, releasing a pulse of power that disrupted the Ichibi's focus, and allowed him a reprieve, when he used to dash at Naruto at speeds barely anyone could follow. Naruto's hand clasped around the hell just as Shikaku reached him. With a roar of exertion and mighty pull, the Dawnbreaker came free from its confines, the silver blade cutting across Shikaku's chest. The holy power of the blade rejected the monster's evil energy, and lit him aflame with white fire. Shikaku screamed in pain as he was burned away. Naruto held the blade parallel to his shoulder with both hands and swung horizontally. Shikaku's head flew from his shoulders as his body erupted in blue flames that burned through the catacombs, disintegrating any undead it came in contact with, and releasing the troubled souls back to their deaths. The body of the man that was once Takeshi the anthropologist burned away until it was not but ashes. Naruto walked down the stairs, holding the Dawnbreaker loosely. As he hit the sand, white sparkles flowed across his vision, adding weight to his already slumped shoulders and sapping his strength. He looked up, seeing Kurenai, Hinata, Shino and Tamari lying on the ground and became alarmed, the adrenaline pushing the welcoming darkness of unconsciousness back. Naruto relaxed slightly as he spotted their chests rising and falling, and let himself slump to the ground on his back. He could only look up as the red hair of Garin filled his vision. Her eyes were still white, showing the Ichibi still being in control. Don't worry, I just want you to rest. I'll take care of you. She reached down and took Naruto in her arms, hugging to her chest tightly. Thank you for freeing me, Naruto. I'll always be in your debt. She kissed his forehead softly as tears of happiness trailed down her face. Well, what's your name? Naruto managed to ask through the descending veil of sleep. I'm Masaruna Sunhama, but my friends call me Shiro. Sleep now. Naruto's eyes closed, and he drifted away into dreams, briefly feeling something soft and silken brush against his lips in a whispered voice. Thank you, my champion. It felt like he was floating in the air, not falling or flying, just floating. A soft breeze tickled his hair, and forced him to pry open his eyes reluctantly. Naruto found himself in a room made from packed sand and wood, a window letting the sunlight from the setting sunshine in. He propped himself up on the pillows and took a look at his bedding. He was surprised to find that it seemed to be made out of white sand. He was not surprised, however, to find himself in his boxers. It had been happening more and more often lately, and he supposed that he was getting used to it. The door opened and admitted Garin into the room. She wore a thin red robe that hugged her slender body and meshed quite well with her hair. Her lips were curved in a thin smile, and the black marks around her eyes had shrunk somewhat, looking less like bruises and more like mascara. Good evening, Naruto. She said, her voice still mostly monotone but also teasing. You must have been tired to sleep through two days. Naruto chuckled lightly. Yeah. Dealing with zombies in a mad lick can really drain your energy. I'm glad it worked out in the end. 
He stretched lightly and yawned. How are the others? Baron moved to his bed and climbed on it, sitting on Naruto's legs. They're perfectly fine. They just finished helping to rebuild the town, and are eating dinner right now. Well, he said, I should go join them, let them know I'm awake. The red-headed Kanoichi waved her hand absently, commanding the sand to move. It wrapped around his hands and pulled him down so his head was resting on the pillows, and she crawled up his body until she was straddling his waist. Not yet. I haven't been able to thank you in my own way yet. Ah. Uh. Baron put a finger on his lips to silence Naruto. I did think about giving you my virginity, she mused, I want to experience what the Jonin did. At that point, Naruto became aware of the contact between their skins. He noticed, Mara did he notice, just how soft her skin was. It was almost like freshly woven silk, warm to the touch and smooth. But Shiro made a point in telling me just how little I know you. Garin continued absently, stroking along the paint on Naruto's face. I've only really known you for about a day. And that's not enough time to really know my desires. She bent forward, and kissed his lips gently. Her lips were like velvet, and the kiss burned against his lips. It didn't move beyond being chaste, but it was sweet, and passionate all the same. Garin parted from Naruto and pointed at her forehead, where the kanji for love sat, carved into her skin. When I carved this into my head, I only thought I could only love myself. But without Shikaku's influence, I know I can find love. She reached down and kissed Naruto softly again, before lying next to him, and cuddling up to his side, letting the grains of sand, that made up her robe fall away, showing her in a conservative red bra and panties. I know you don't love me yet, Naruto, but you will in time. Just like I will. I can feel it. She took a pinch of white sand and flicked it in Naruto's eyes, making him fall asleep immediately. She snuggled up to him and pulled a blanket of sand over their bodies, and then let herself drift off, to dreams of blonde-haired man and a red-haired woman making love under the full moon. The next day, after the town had thanked them for their services in stopping the mummies in Shikaku, teammate, Naruto and the sand siblings left, heading back together on a path that would eventually split and take them to their own villages. But first, a pit stop to take in one of the cooler tourist attractions in Kaze no Kuni. The Arrow is one of the fastest flowing rivers in the world, Tamari commented, watching the water rush past so quickly it didn't even roar. It can pick up boulders and carry them downstream. No one has really followed it to where it ends, but it's also the longest water feature in Kaze no Kuni. Konkuro hefted a rock. Watch. He tossed it into the water, and the Kanoha ninja watched in amazement as it was carried on the current with speed like that of an arrow in flight. That's amazing. Hinata said with awe. Naruto approached the edge and looked down at it with wonder. Where does all this water come from? He asked. Tamari shrugged. No one really knows. Don't stand too close to the edge, though. The banks tend to erode away early. With a small crack, the ground shifted and broke, dumping Naruto into the rapids of the arrow with little warning. Naruto. They screamed in shock. They all raced down the bank, catching sight of Naruto's black vest and blonde hair through the water. Naruto felt like he was being crushed, drowned and smashed with battering rams at the same time. He bound off of a rock embedded in the bed of the rapids, hearing his spine crack through the roaring in his ears. He slammed into another rock, lashing out in desperation and digging his talons into the surface of the stone. He couldn't pull himself up from the strength of the tide, it was too fast. His eyes connected with the horrified eyes of the ones on the bank. He struggled to push his other hand into the air, and it took all of his willpower to cast the water-breathing spell, before the rapids ripped him from the rock. He smashed into the ground, red-hot pain emanating from his back, before Naruto knew no more. Kono Higakure, Hokage's office. Saratobi Hirzen smoked his pipe with relish, enjoying the feeling of victory that came with his conquering of his most hated enemy. The group of secretaries he had finally managed to hire, had taken a load off his shoulder, and hands. The door slid open, admitting teammate into the office. Hirza looked up, the smile on his face dying at the red eyes present on the team. What happened? He asked seriously. At his question, Hanada burst into tears and clutched Shino for comfort. As Kuranai began to speak, Hirzen felt his sense of victory flee like chaff before a hurricane. Kono Higakure, Hokage's office. Do you know what this is about? Kakashi asked Guy lazily. The excitable man shrugged, surprisingly summer. I don't really know, but I feel something very unyouthful in the air. The Hokage arrived and sat himself down, his hat covering his eyes. This is never easy to say, he spoke in a quite sad tone. But one of our own has gone missing. Naruto's breath exploded from his mouth, along with a good amount of water. He could feel the knife-like blades of rock stuck in his back, and in the back of his right thigh. He definitely wouldn't be walking anytime soon. After a successful mission with a team from Sunagakure, Team Aid and Naruto stopped by a tourist attraction in Kaze no Kuni, the arrow. He dragged himself away from the bank of the slower flowing river, biting back the burning pain from his wounds. He reached down, and yanked a shard of rock from the back of his thigh, clenching his teeth to avoid shouting. Hey, I see someone. Unfortunately, an accident occurred, and Naruto was pulled into the river, which swept him away quickly. 
Kurenai and her team, along with the team from Suna, attempted to follow him from the bank, but the river was too fast, even for them. One of the people approaching him was swathed in bandages, an odd gauntlet on his right arm. Another was a boy with spiky black hair and a shirt that had shy repeated on it. The last was a girl, with long black hair that reached her waist. The spiky-haired youth rushed forward and kicked Naruto across the face, sending the blonde to the ground in a daze. They followed the river to its end, recovering Naruto's equipment as they went. They found that the arrow ends at a high cliff, which leads to blinding mist. They also found signs of a scuffle. The bandaged one held his gauntlet over Naruto, and tapped it rhythmically. He's got two shards of stone lodged through his ribs, piercing his lungs. He'll choke on his own blood, before we can take him anywhere. He's useless. The girl protested weakly, we can alert others, right? They can take him to orichimaru sama The leader shook his head. No. It's not worth it. Zaku, get rid of this trash. Zaku, the specky-haired boy, stepped forward with sick grin. Gladly. He thrust his arm out, revealing what appeared to be a tube implanted in his arm. Eat this. Zankai. Sir Toby tilted his hat down to hide his features further. As of 2am, Naruto Uzumaki is pronounced MIA, possibly KIA. Search parties will be gathered tomorrow. Dismiss. Samui, Yujido, Tenten, Ino, Sakura and Satsuki gasped in horror. Nijiko and Hinabi had already been told, and therefore wore stoic faces. Even Satsuriku bore a look of shock and concern. They knew that they would be the first to search. They didn't know that it would be six months, before he was found. The air that blasted from the tube in Zaku's arm, hit Naruto with the force of train, picking him up and hurling him over the side of the cliff, and down into the mists that hid everything underneath them. Naruto's last sight was the regretful brown eyes of the girl. And then, the mist drew over his vision. And after that, darkness. Thanks for listening. I do hope you enjoyed. If you want a next part of this video, like subscribe, and comment down below, and turn on that bell notification, and also check out the other videos that I have created, and enjoy. See you in the next video. Peace.